um, tonight we we get to to um, hear from Don Troyer. The way groups with Don come into being um, are usually like this. I get an email and Don will say uh, something like, I've been musing about this and I wonder if it would have any value as a Thursday group or a weekend group or something like that at Apple Farm. It's very much the way Helen um, often gave her groups. Don's a part of the leadership at the farm. He lives next door. He's an MD and he's a Jungian analyst. And tonight he's bringing his thoughts about boundary making as an expression of the savior archetype. Don. Okay. Well, it's good to be with you. It's like we are sitting around the round house, in the round house around a circle, kind of. So that feels really good. My thoughts tonight that I'm going to share with you come out of Jung's dream analysis seminar. It's a place where Jung was more relaxed and, and had a dialogue with the participants. So you get the Jung who's more off the cuff and natural and spontaneous and tells jokes. And um, it's been a wonderful resource for me to see that more natural part of Jung. So I came across a, a phrase that uh, triggered some thoughts about this subject of the savior as a uh, maker of boundaries. So I thought I'd um, expand on that and that's what I have to share with you tonight. So there are gonna be a number of little quotes from the dream analysis and I'll try to point those out when I uh, share them. So the first quote from the, the book is, Jung says, only fools think that everything can be explained. The true substance of the world is inexplicable. So this great scientific mind who contributed so much still retained this respect for mystery, for the essential mystery of the world. And I think it's one thing that has always led me to Jung and keeps me coming back to Jung. Um, and it's consistent with the farm's commitment to paying attention to the mystery, I think. So in, his, in this uh, seminar and um, on pages 12 and 13, he, he says these things. <clears throat> he talked about the effect of what images hold one. One can't just see anything, the ugly for instance, without being punished. The aspect of ugliness builds something ugly in the soul, especially if the germ is there already. At first, we don't recognize it as ourself. St. Augustine wrote, I thank thee, Lord, that thou didst not make me responsible for my dreams. A saint would have terrible dreams. We are human. Anything can reach us, for we reach from the gods down into hell. Then only when we are horrified and upset and chaotic, do we cry out for a savior, as in the time of Christ. What was staged every day in the arena showed the need for a savior. It's an interesting fact that in several Gnostic systems, the definition of savior is the maker of boundary lines. The one that gives us a clear idea of where we begin and where we end. Most people, Jung says, don't know. They are either too small or too big, particularly when they begin to assimilate the images of the unconscious. That is why people prefer a safe persona. This is myself. Otherwise, they don't know who they are. The main fear of the unconscious is that we forget who we are. That's the end of that quote. So in thinking about this um, idea of the savior as maker of boundary lines, I first thought of the idea of the savior, you think of a, a rescuer, a liberator, one who frees from bondage or enslavement. That's more of a traditional understanding of the savior. The Christian savior saves the believer from the alienating hold of sin leading to spiritual death. 
and fear of a physical death without hope of rescue from the threat of damnation. A savior who is the maker of boundary lines is less familiar. How, from a psychological point of view, is the archetype of the savior the maker of boundary lines? And what purpose does this serve? And as Jung said, this maker is the one that gives us a clear idea of where we begin and where we end. Some scriptural examples of, from the Christian tradition of Jesus as boundary breaker were, with the saving effect, were asking the Samaritan woman, an unclean person for a Jew of his time, for a drink of water at the well. Another example is eating grains of wheat on the Sabbath in scandalous defiance of the rules of the Pharisees of that time against any kind of work on the Sabbath. Another example is being a guest and eating at the home of tax collectors who were hated as having sold out to the corrupt Roman and local authorities. Changing water to fine wine and enjoying it at a wedding in defiance of those who would advocate asceticism at all times. And accepting the anointing of his feet with expensive oil in defiance of some of the disciples' moral objections that such wealth should always be given to the poor. And last of all, his furious driving out of the temple of the money changers and sellers with a whip of cords saying, you must not turn my father's house into a market. So no prosperity gospel at work then. So those are some examples of Jesus' boundary breaker, and probably they're very familiar to all of us. Some examples of Jesus as boundary maker, standing his ground and saying no to the three temptations to power of the adversary in the desert, leaving the crowds with their endless needs to go off by himself for, to a secluded place, intervening with the woman being stoned for being taken in adultery as the law of the time dictated, calling out the scribes and Pharisees, calling them white in tombs for their hypocrisy, and accepting his calling to be the sacrificed one out of love for the Father, and telling Peter to get behind him, Satan, when Peter tried to talk him out of it. So psychologically, Jung is pointing to the importance of a boundary-making savior when the individual is confronted with an experience of the unconscious. The deeper unconscious is an infinity. Our ego, being finite, will always be less than it and can feel threatened and overwhelmed when encountering elements from the unconscious. An analogy that Jung provides in this dream analysis book is that the ego is like a small bay connected to the ocean. They're both of the same watery substance, but they are enormously different in size. The channel between them is an interface just like the ego self-axis. It might need a breakwater when the ocean is stirred up. A hurricane or tsunami or a rogue wave can come in and really swamp that little bay. And the ocean of the collective unconscious is immense, carrying the experience of the two million year old person we all carry around within us as collective ancestral memory. Another analogy that Jung offers from the Dream Analysis book on page 225 is, our dialogue with the conscious, unconscious, has the potential of making a garden out of a jungle. Only men and women make a garden. Nature, never. So one of our functions is to encounter the immensity of things like the ocean and the jungle of the collective unconscious and build things that are manageable for us a small bay or a pond or a garden. As Jung said, when we are horrified and upset and chaotic, we do cry out for a savior. It is when we are upset either over outer events or inner ones that we do this crying out. 
as the encounter with the unconscious can feel horrifying, like a defeat for the ego and its presumption of autonomy and control. As he continued to say, Jung, one cannot trust the unconscious, absolutely. One can only say this is what the unconscious would naturally choose. It does not mean when it states a condition that is necessarily good or advisable. It merely shows things the way they are, important information as to the inclination of one's nature. So he's asking us to bring our judgment to the process of doing our dream work and our work with our inner selves and not taking prompts from the unconscious whole, whole hog of just swallowing them whole. He thinks that would, that's unwise. At the same time, we have to listen to the unconscious. It draws us into relationship. Again, here's a quote from Jung. We cannot endure unconsciousness. For instance, we have psychological symptoms and we must know what these bewildering things are coming from. We cannot see who is running the thing inside of us. It is though we lived on the first floor and mysterious things are going on in the basement. We hear funny smells and we hear quiet queer noises and we cannot live that way. We must know what's going on. So, the unconscious unsettled us, unsettles us, it brings up these questions and concerns, and it arouses our curiosity. Sometimes it blocks our way, and we're drawn into a relationship. But it's one that uh, has to be entered consciously, and one that we need to respect our own particularity. So what are some of these experiences of being horrified and upset and chaotic? We'll look at some inner states as well as outer ones, and often these coincide. A nightmare is a classic example. Um, also a shattering waking experience like Paul's life-changing vision on the road to Damascus, or a near-death experience, a relational crisis. A teacher has a car breakdown in the inner city. A doctor on vacation in a foreign country is called to pronounce a man killed in suspicious circumstances. A distracted American traveler leaves a bag with his passport and airplane ticket on a tube train in London in 1970. That would be me. And I was rescued by a Brit I had never met, whose name I remember to this day. Thank you, Mr. Walworth. He turned my bag into the American embassy and saved my bacon. These encounters with the collective unconscious can be powerful confrontations to our everyday ego functioning, numinous in generating feelings of awe, trepidation, wonder, and terror. They often set up experiences of synchronicity, meaningful coincidences, which both relativize the sense of the ego being in control, but also grant a feeling of companioning presence in the world. They can be so overwhelming that they risk flooding the ego and causing it to forget who one is. Other examples might be the senator who runs off with an exotic dancer half his age, summarily ending, ending his political career. <coughs> a state office worker who squanders his carefully saved life savings and being overtaken by a passion for gambling, the rejected lover who leaves all to follow a guru to the ashram in India, and a medical doctor, Brew Joy, talks about being happily practicing medicine. One day he heard a voice that said he had to leave everything and go to India. <clears throat> and so he did. And then there's our familiar story of our Helen Luke being so seized by Jung's work in reading the archetypes of the collective unconscious that she read it throughout an entire night. And this ultimately led to her changing her life 
leaving England, coming to America, leaving in the process her dying mother and temporarily leaving her two children to establish a new life in California and later Three Rivers. So the boundary maker is the one who gives us a clear idea of where we begin and where we end. And as Jung says, most people don't know. They're either too small or too big. That's why people prefer a safe persona. This is myself. So what's the difference between a safe persona and a clear idea of where we begin and where we end? The difference is in this encounter with the unconscious, the ocean and the jungle and the crisis of needing the savior archetype to help point out the boundary. Encounters with the unconscious are a double-edged experience, potentially freeing towards wholeness, but also carrying the risk of danger of forgetting who we are. How is this who formed? Main components of the who are the ego, this point of view we have as our own personal point of consciousness, our persona, which comes from the Latin meaning actor's mask and refers to one's social identity, the training and societal expectations. And how are these boundaries made? Yours versus mine, yes versus no, this far and no more, safe versus non-safe, national, tribal, familial, religious. Tradition and history, sacred texts, elders and teachers, moral code. The trenches of adaptation to toilet training, family expectations, and socialization in school and church environments. So while a necessary requirement for functioning in society, these can be limiting if an over-identification with them inhibits individual psychological development. There may be no room for the with the persona room for shadow contents. The exemplary teacher, politician, nurse, or doctor must always conform to the societal ideal and suppress other aspects of their personality that might contribute to individuation. Jung said this: if people are identical with their crust, they can do nothing but live their biography and there is nothing immortal about them. They become neurotic and the devil gets at them. So if you're over identified with your persona, Jung is saying you, you tend to become neurotic and these devilish elements can get at you. It's like Popeye saying, I am what I am and that's all that I am, you know? This, that's all there is. What you see is what you get. No mystery. So meeting with the unconscious or encounter with the shadow, these traits and potentials one tends to reject and ignore, sets up a challenge for the ego and persona to grow, freeze, or flee. As Jung wrote, the whole meaning of sin is that you have to carry it. Otherwise, you deny your brother, your shadow, that imperfect being in you that follows after and does everything which you are loath to, to do. <clears throat> All the things you are too cowardly or too decent to do. So that's one definition of the shadow. Carrying all the potentials you're too cowardly or too decent to do. <clears throat> to grow means building a container and a capacity for relationship with the unconscious. Jung termed this the ego self axis, a living relational bond. Without a functioning ego self axis, it's dangerous for the ego to have undefended exposure to the collective unconscious. The Christian era emerged from the brutalities of the ancient world and set the values of the individual self-sacrifice and love in place. Over the centuries, the institutionally institutionalization of these ideals 
led to a distancing from these sources of vital energy and a diminution of the vitality of the collective church experience. It's as if the bay had gotten separated from the ocean and formed an isolated pond and presumed to be all the water in the world. This can leave a lot out and leave the pond especially vulnerable when the storm swamps the isthmus. So this relational process between our fragile egos and the unconscious, Jung says, is full of risks and dangers. It's possible there might be something remote, some latent trouble in the unconscious, like freight that has gotten loose that might lead to some local disruption. A piece of ancestral stuff which doesn't fit with the conscious psychology. This is frequent, Jung says, and makes work difficult and dangerous. Thus the need for us as individuals to seek a yoga of our own, to personalize these ideals instituted by the Christian era. And this can be spiritual practice, dream work, psychotherapy, committed community participation, when it includes respect for and knowledge of realm of the spirit, physical discipline, and persistence. The classic symbol of this ego self relationship is the mandala, an image of symmetry, tension, infinity, and emergence, which is changing and charged. The term mandala comes from the Greek Sanskrit term meaning magic circle. And there are three forms of mandalas a static design, the magic circle, the mandala dance, many societies dance their mandalas, and the third one is the mandala in time, of the performance through life. This was one I hadn't heard of before reading it in this dream analysis book. So Jung says, one becomes the child of God only by carrying the cross. If the life is lived without neurotic nonsense, it will be seen as an accomplishment of the mandala in time. So if we can free ourselves from some of our neurotic nonsense Jung talks about, our lives can become like this mandala in three-dimensional time. I think it's a wonderful image from just the typical images of the static mandala to, to see it as and a, an outgrowing of a life well lived. The structure of mandalas is like the human body with appendages and a center and energetic emanations. The Chinese idea is that the mandala is a symbol for the subtle body. So the mandala is like a visible sign of these subtle energies that inhabit our electromagnetic fields that we don't know too much about um, but seem to be a definitely real thing. So if there is a proper relationship to these links to the unconscious, the shadow and animus and anima, they function as a conduit where there's a healthy flow between the bay and the ocean, or there's a healthy connection between the garden and nature. When the shadow has been owned and eaten sufficiently, it functions as an enlivener and a deepener, and less as a tsunami of catastrophic disaster. An everyday example of this is from Marion Woodman's book, Addiction to Perfection, where she talks about her long running battle of wanting to eat too much chocolate cake. And so she gave the chocolate cake a, a voice and had it out with the cake saying, getting the cake says, you know, you want to eat me all. And she says, well, I do, but I'm not going to. So that's a very everyday simple example of how an, an, an a living relational process between something that could be very automatic and unconscious is made to be a conscious relationship. 
The power of the unconscious is its power to expand possibilities beyond the confines of the ego, to see the wider and indeed infinite picture. It could be a beatific vision, inspiring and energizing, but also it can be impersonal. The usual boundaries of social and moral adaptation can be suspended. And because we undervalue the importance of imagination, Jung says, the anima and animus have tremendous influence because we leave the shadow to them. So if we don't have any kind of healthy relationship to our contrasexual inner selves, they all tend to fall into the shadow and then they take on these enormous energies that can happen to us like fate. So the root of the, the terms anima and anima are the same as the ones for animal. They're activated instincts. So their anima and animus are living links to these deep archetypal powers. And they don't seem to care about the horizontal relational effects they have on us too much. They just want to live and breathe. So their energetic systems of compelling energy and being affected by them can be both enlivening and generate immense creativity, but can inundate the ego into forgetting itself. And one can wake up sometime later in a state of bewilderment and confusion, wondering what the heck happened. So some examples of Jung's comment that most people are either too big or too small when they begin to assimilate the images of the unconscious and prefer a safe persona are, let's look at the too big category. When um, most people are too big, um, people like uh, Hitler, for example, who take on these bigger than life uh, projections and empowerments um, are obvious. In, a, in the uh, public sphere, the Kardashians, I think, would qualify as carriers of this kind of projection. Um, a host of actors and, act and performers who have died tragically due to um, driving too fast, drug overdoses, alcoholism or suicide are, are tragic uh, casualties. In my view, our current president carries an immoral, unempathic energy of using whatever means it takes to gain and keep power and is a master manipulator of image and word to mesmerize and mobilize instinctual levels of fear and hate. He carries the archetype of Mercurius, the shapeshifter, mesmerizing, master dealing, deal maker, silky communicator. Yeah. These folks get taken over by their image, roll, and, and press, and become inflated. So that's some examples of the too big category. When are people too small? When they get overtaken by a nervous breakdown, perhaps, or uh, workaholism, or su submit to a, an, a substance abuse addiction. Um, or become a true believer in a, a fanatical um, political group. Those would be examples of the too small. So uh, the central point in, in this insight of the savior as maker of boundaries, the one who gives us a clear idea of our particularity, is that... <clears throat> Images have a hold on us, with the ugly ones eventually generating a state of horror that results in us calling out for help. And this energy of the unconscious rises in response to these states of horror and fear and um, brings to consciousness um, what our boundaries are. Um, it appears to, helps us say this and not that. Enough already. It appeals to the classic Christian virtues of simplicity, 
humility, fidelity, loyalty, and love as guides, but from a moral sense generated from within as opposed to just being dictated by external rules. I think that's a crucial point because Jung was all about a morality, but it was a morality that had been transfused and transformed within the individual and lived from within out. So this affirms the sufficiency of being and rescues one from the altered and perhaps inflated states of desire, anxiety, and despair. Even states of despair can be an inundation by the unconscious and needs to be uh, limited. So the savior appeals to our beleaguered ego to gather itself and stand in relationship to the bigger unconscious, not unlike how Job did with Yahweh. The ego has a say in the negotiations about what is manageable. As Jung says, what is digestible? So we have to allow for what we can digest when we're relating to these bigger than personal energies, as opposed to being completely uh, overcome by these absolute and impersonal compulsions of archetypal energy. So that's, that's the uh, things to share tonight. Um, this take on this idea of a savior function that operates within us when we get to places in our life where we really genuinely feel overwhelmed and need some assertion of the, our rights to our own particularity. So I'd be very glad to open it to discussion. Any co questions or comments that you might have? Very much, Don. I um, thoroughly enjoyed what you had to say, and I'm. I was just looking at my notes, and I was thinking this um, sentence of yours: "Where we begin and where we end." Um, this afternoon, I spent a good deal of time with. Um, palliative staff and um, we were speaking of this very thing not in light of what you said this evening but where do we begin where do we end and particularly uh, where do we end and given it's COVID the very strict rules on uh, lots of things um, so I wonder if you could elaborate a little more on uh, something of how it touches you, this sense of where we begin and where we end? Well, I suppose what comes up for me, Jane, is that um, when we encounter uh, the unconscious, usually it, it um, draws us out of a too small adaptation with our persona that has been built it challenges it. It says there must be more. So where we begin and where we end is we've sort of outgrown it. Mm -hmm. and, and we need, we need to be extended and expanded. But um, there's this other side of it that when we're expanding, we also need to know what our limits are and how much um, is a uh, particular to us to grow into. What is our garden? What's our bay? And being careful um, to not getting, not getting uh, unrooted completely from ourselves. So it, it's sort of the other side of the coin from what where many Jungian sorts of writings start from, which is about this more expansive and opening up relation to the unconscious, which is so important. But this is sort of the other side of it mm -hmm. um, that I think deserves some notice too. Indeed, thank you. Thank you very much. So for some reason, I'm reminded of uh, something a former uh, supervisor of mine said when I would get overextended, he said, you know, Mary, just because it's a good idea doesn't mean you have to do it. And I think that 
that's what sort of what you were saying reminded me a little bit of in terms of the unconscious has all kinds of things we might work on and develop and and we and we also have a right to say no to that as well i think <laughs> right curious i find myself thinking of just a very basic uh piece and i'm wondering if you can expand on it a little bit more help me flesh it out this idea are you when you say the savior function works within us to to either draw out the too small vision of ourselves i think of the negative animus voice that can be especially loud when I have just um, done something expansive. Uh, and wondering if that's, if it's the, somehow the savior that can come and speak against that negative animus and create a boundary that that animus voice can't uh, just run me over. That's really a good point, Katie. I think you're right on that, that the, the negative animus wants to uh, shut down that growing relationship between the bay and the ocean. It's, it's, uh, it's frightening or it's, it feels exposed and it wants to keep things safe. It wants to restore the persona. And so in that sense, I think the savior archetype would, would argue for limiting the, the power of that internal persecutor or critical voice and uh, kind of um, enhance the flow between uh, the bay and the ocean. Um, but it's a, it's a really good and subtle point uh, about how the, the animus and anima are not always our friends. You know, they, they sometimes are our adversary. It's like Jung saying, we can't always just trust the unconscious. We have to be conscious in our relationship to it. Does that answer your question or address it? Yes, thank you. Okay. I guess one follow up so that uh, what would you name that that part of us then that um, like is that that savior function um, a shadow piece or my ego or what allows me at that minute moment to access that ability to set that boundary. Well, that's a really good question, too. I don't see it as an ego or a shadow piece. I think it's another element, and it probably hasn't been defined very well in our typical way of talking about these things, which is why it caught my attention, I think, and I wanted to, uh, to share it, because we don't really have a name for it, really. Um, and, and Savior probably has been too hijacked by our religious uh, tradition and background. So that may not be the best exact name from it from a psychological standpoint, but um, it reminds us who we are and what we can tolerate. I guess it's sort of a limit setter in that regard, in a healthy sense, healthy limits. It's a boundary maker. It, 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 it says, able to say no. It says, this is much this much i can handle and i can't handle more and feels okay about it not it's not uh, uh hamstrung by guilt when it has to say no so it's it's a healthy it's a healthy boundary making function um but we need a better word for it now that you're asking these questions um i'd love to hear anybody's uh, suggestions about that but um we need a better name for this particular archetype. The word that came to me was the balancer. Okay. I like that. In a very dynamic sense, it's balancing all the time. So it's a dynamic function. It isn't static, you know, it isn't rigid. <laughs> 
it can flow, it can move with the currents. It's fluid. Uh, it, it occurred to me another word could be our inner cartographer. A cartographer uh -huh. who makes maps and finds where the boundaries are. Yeah. And just, and just names them without putting value on them necessarily. That, that's good too. It, and it, it's a personal map, right, Donise? Yeah. It's not a universal map. It's not the other person's map. It's not society's map. It's your map. Yeah, yeah. I like that a lot. You said something about the self-ego axis acting as mediator of those unconscious contents. Is it related to that? Um, yes. Um, I think it's a part of the ego self axis, uh, an important part of it. Um, yeah, it's it's this um, this fluid boundary between this this smaller bay and the big ocean. Um, that's a it's a living and fluid uh, relational dynamic. In some ways, you could think of it as a living being, almost. I hadn't thought of it quite in those terms, not as a function, but almost as a person. <laughs> so I'm thinking out loud here, but um, I kind of like that, too. The guardian angel, maybe, would be uh, a traditional way of seeing it. Um, I like the term guardian angel. Uh, that really resonates. So, thanks for that piece there, Don. Mm -hmm. Don, does the, um, I mean, I'm kind of taken by these um, new uh, other words besides savior or boundary. Yeah. Maker and keeper. And, you know, I mean, it, and I, I like the inner cartographer and I like the balancer and the guardian angel. And, and I, I just wonder what, um, what savior brings to us that those uh, don't, I don't know. That's what you're wondering too, I think. What, what is the, um, well, how will the naming impact this? Well, it reminds me, Joanne, that if it's a living symbol, it's going to have a lot of names, all right? It's going to have different holographic manifestations for every, each person. So maybe it's okay that we don't shackle it with just one name. <laughs> that may that may do violence to it. Um, so um, maybe it's a new archetype we've kind of discovered here tonight. We can we can call it the apple farm archetype. This is Dawn, and oh. I'm now sharing the room with Tom because my computer. Joanne, when you ask the question, I wonder what Savior might add. Um, some, some element of transformation is at work for me in the term Savior. I think of that transform, what happens in the crucible, what happens in the cross, what happens is not only the suffering, it's not only the, the boundaries being transgressed, but there's something else that's, that's coming to life. And I wonder if that's part of the power of using such a uh, overwhelming name for it. It does have that kind of association of yeah. transforming life. Yeah. Yeah, that's really a, a good point too, that it's a, it's a transformer of energy. Um, one way of thinking about this is that it's it's like a transformer that steps down the high voltage high wire that would fry us if we touched it into manageable energy that we can heat our homes and turn our lights on with um, that's that's a good analogy of this function we're talking about I think so I think it's also a transformer I think you're right <laughs> 
one of the things that comes to my mind is that Savior implies a certain sacrifice, and uh, maybe it's the flow of love between the unconscious and conscious, sort of a, a moderator of um, the flow. Yes. And of course, the sacrifice, which is what a Savior does, sacrifices his life for ours. Yeah, it's a sacrifice of infinite possibilities into particularities. Yes. Mm -hmm. And that inevitably means grieving of, of uh, paths not taken. That's another whole function of this we haven't really talked about. But it, the, one of the transforming works of it is that it requires active grief work all the time. And that's sort of appropriate for us in the pandemic, don't you think, here? Because we've all had to make so many involuntary adjustments. And uh, how are we doing with being actively working with the grief and transforming that versus just feeling uh, um, afflicted and abused or, or scared and, and uh, hopeless? I think that's all work we can be doing these days. Well, this is going back a little bit to where we were using the different names. And if I'm hearing um, at, at some level what you're saying, the first things that come to me are the inner voice or the inner guide. And just learning to pay attention to that. Yes. That's right. That's another great... Um function and it inner the inner voice and the inner guide and learning how to discern that um right yeah sorting paying attention and discerning sorting that out from the negative anima or animus mm -hmm. for example yeah or the inner saboteur and the inner inner persecutors that are always lurking in wait for us I think someone else might have said this, but I do like the idea of the using the savior uh, image because that that implies um, a great deal of power and um, powerful assistance. Um, and something, and, and a part we can really count on. So, I like that. So, so Don, Lynn and I would both like to hear you say again what you said just a little bit ago about in the pandemic, we, and neither of us can bring it back what you said, but we'd like to. Maybe you can't either. I just simply said that the pandemic has brought all of us involuntarily to states of loss and sacrifice. We've been forced to give up many of the things that we uh, assume are ours by right, the things we expect, uh, including our own uh, security of our own safety. Um, so all of that we can either take passively and get absorbed in helplessness and um, fear and resentment, or we can do some active grief work with that and uh, try to find our own particularity in relation to it. Um, it's coming to terms with, it's, it's the acceptance process of grief where you have to work through denial and anger and bargaining and all that stuff until you get to a point where um, um, you've done your work with it, basically, as, as opposed to just wishing it would go away, <laughs> or even worse, acting like it isn't real. There's a lot of that out there, too, isn't there, these days? We haven't talked about this, but I'm, I'm sure 
that many of us are reflecting on what nature is trying to tell us with this, right? Um, maybe the message is pretty obvious <laughs> to many of us, but maybe not. Um, but um, I do think the collective unconscious speaks through nature, myself, and I do think these big um, events in our world history have meaning. So I tend to think that there is some purposefulness in uh, this disaster and uh, we're meant to contemplate it and try to extract some meaning out of it and hopefully uh, digest it enough to uh, learn the lessons and, and change our lives appropriately. You know, uh, not to put too fine a point on it, but this is the fifth one of these um, animal to human jump viruses this century. Yeah. There'll be many more. Yeah. In 20 years, Tom, in this century, that's what you're saying, right? Yeah, SARS-1, MERS, Ebola, uh, uh, what was the other one? Um, and this one, there's another one in there, yes. H1N1. H1N1, that's it, you're right. Thank you, Rita. And I might add, um, HIV was one of these too. Mm. Uh, so we've been given the message many times. Yeah, yeah. I want to remember the devil might get at me every day, Dawn, so. <laughs> <laughs> and um, I look at you and uh, I think how in Canada we've been very firm. We're not letting the Americans in. We're not opening up our borders. We're, we're frightened. Yeah. Yeah. And yet we, uh, we're quite uh, willing to let drivers go down there and get all kinds of produce and products for us. And uh, oh. yeah, it's, um, so I don't feel very neighborly being a part of a country that's not being very neighborly to you. So um, I hope that all ends mm. before too long. Yeah. I was just um, curious about how PAN and the pandemic and the many pandemics we're experiencing, uh, violence, um, you know, the plague, of course, COVID-19, how PAN enters into the savior archetype? Mm, that's a really great question, <laughs> Marilyn. Yeah, PAN, of course, is the root of... Um, Panic mm -hmm. and um, pandemic. Um, pan, you know, is this god of uh, absolute noise. Um, pandemonium, the din of a pan yeah. is an overwhelming uh, noise that's um, that renders mindlessness. <clears throat> you can't think when pan is around; it's just too loud. Yeah, don't you? I, I mean, I feel pan is has ascended the throne and yeah. is alive and well in the U.S. <laughs> yeah, it's really, it's really a good point. Um, but I wonder um, also, <laughs> since I had all this pen up when I was muted, um, the two big um, aspect of the savior, and you mentioned the current administration, and I was just, you know, it's just interesting to me to see how many are feeding in into that one way or another? Yes. Um, you know, nobody, I mean, yeah, this is an inflated person for sure. I don't think there's any question about that. But um, what I find conversely is the too small, how people are becoming so small that they are blaming this one individual for everything. And it's like, it's one person. Um, how, does that work? And then it almost to me becomes like the scapegoat. 
that I can't do anything because it's all his fault. And how does the scapegoat then aspect, is that an aspect of the savior? Or is that something else? <laughs> well, I think the savior would function in defense of the individual's both responsibility to mm -hmm. act and take care of their own integrity and not give way either to passive being carried along by the by the political currents either way either yeah a, either way either yeah in a panicky frenzy or an apathy response <clears throat> um the, so the i think what we're talking about would would not want to get um go would would not lose their footing either way they would try to mm -hmm. find their own response to it and um lastly i was uh, uh it brought to mind the boundaries um the I Ching's limitation voluntarily chosen limits empower your growth um that um kind of along with the pandemic um <laughs> that you know just playing with the idea that we've chosen it instead of it being imposed on us that somehow our actions and i think to me it gets back to where did this virus originate and and what practices are we have we as a collective done to kind of almost encourage this kind of epidemic pandemic um So in a sense, we've chosen it, albeit unconsciously. But, yeah, unconsciously. You know, it's just kind of. Well, it's been noticeable, right, that the levels of pollution have gone down tremendously, the air pollution, yes. and ozone yeah. protection, because of the pandemic. It's not been something we could do or chose, but right. we've, gotten, we've gotten an indirect benefit out of it, even though it's also been a terrible tragedy. The planet is doing better. <laughs> In yes. response to it yeah so maybe an answer to a prayer <laughs> not the answer we anticipated but maybe an answer right nonetheless so we are at about 8 15. <laughs> often when we end thursday group thank you don troyer we can all wave our thanks or unmute if you'd like <laughs> unmute. <laughs> um, and speak them and thanks to everyone who has participated by your presence and your words and your silence um, it's, it's good to be together here yeah. like this and make Thank something you. possible that aren't possible otherwise